we are so elated to have you with us with our weekly Bible study. And we are in the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 3. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again. And we ask you right now, Lord, to allow us to, uh, to go into your inventory of truth. We pray right now for clarity of mind and thought that we may apprehend the riches of your mercy and your grace that you have bestowed upon us in your word. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 3. Uh, you know, after this writer has shown the superiority of Jesus over the angels, he showed his superiority over the prophets. Now in this chapter, in this third chapter, he's making the case to show the superiority of Jesus over Moses. So, and he uses the references of uh, Israel's unfaithfulness in the wilderness as a backdrop for giving us the second of those six warnings that we find in this epistle. Now, the first warning was against neglecting this great salvation. And the second warning, we're going to see it come up right here. Now, let's, uh, let's, let's just get started. Uh, verse 1. So, the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 3. That's our title. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. That is essentially the subject of our of, of, of this chapter. He's making the case for Jesus Christ. The, he, may, he began making the case in chapter 1 when he established that Jesus was superior to the angels. He, he established that Jesus was superior to the prophets. Now remember, he's writing to a Hebrew, he's writing to these Jewish Christians, and these Jewish Christians are under a lot of pressure to go back into Judaism, to, to, to go back into Phariseeism. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of error being taught out there, and there's a lot of uh, uh, persecution, and uh, you know, when, when um, uh, uh, a lot of your friends and relatives, they don't like the fact that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and uh, these followers of Christ, these Hebrew Christians, are, getting, are taking a lot of flack. So there's a lot of pressure for them to go backwards. And, and, and one of the things about the Jews, they have always, when you start trying to preach to them about Jesus, they all, fall, they all like to fall back to Moses. Moses was very important to them. So what the writer to the Hebrews know, he knew that he needed to do was to show the superiority of Jesus over Moses. He's not saying that, that Moses was not great. Everyone agrees in the history of the world, in the history of Judaism, Moses was a great man. And there are some who believe, uh, th those who have not uh, come to, to take on Jesus Christ, they, they cling to Moses. Uh, 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 like the, the Muslim clings to Muhammad, the Jews, those Orthodox, those Old, uh, uh, Old Testament Jews, they cling to Moses. So what, what um, the, the writer to the Hebrews may or may not have been Paul. I don't know who wrote it. I'm not going to speculate. But he's trying to make the case. It looked like it might have been Paul, just looking at some of the stuff that was written and how it was written. It may very well have been Paul, but I can't prove it, and I'm not going to worry about it. So he says, when he talks about holy, wherefore holy brethren, holy means set apart. Brethren refers to the other Hebrews, so you know you know who he's talking about. So whoever whoever wrote it is a Hebrew too. Okay, he's a he's a Jew himself. So we know it wasn't a Gentile writer. And, and, and he says, partakers. Of the heavenly calling, partake it. That means we are in this together. We are in a fellowship, in a brotherhood. And the heavenly calling 
the uh, the Jews, the, the they were not heavenly about the Jews, but the calling was heavenly. So the, the heavenly calling, they are in this together. The, the Hebrews were a very earthly people. So when he says this heavenly calling, it has originated from something other than what we are accustomed to. And he says, apostle, when he identifies Jesus Christ, he says, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. This is the case. He's making the case. This is his opening argument in the court of law. Who was faithful to him that appointed him also as Moses was faithful in all his house. So he's letting you know Christ Jesus was faithful. Now we all agree that Moses was faithful. But Jesus Christ was faithful to, to the one that appointed him. Who appointed Jesus to Christ? God the Father. The same one who appointed Moses. But look what he says here in verse 3. See, Jesus verse 3. But this man, he's talking to Jesus, counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who has built the house had more honor than the house. Jesus is the, he is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, he, he spoke the world into existence. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God spoke, let it be, and it was. God spoke the word. So Jesus w was in the beginning with God. As God created the heavens and the earth, he did it by the agency of the word of God, who is Jesus. The word became flesh. I'll need you to grab the whole of that part of the time. Uh, just like he wanted the Jews to grab hold of it. He wanted those Hebrew Christians that were tempted to go backwards. Don't go backwards. I need you to go forward. I need you to stand fast. I, I want you need to stand fast. And he's trying to help them. He's trying to encourage them. Verse 4. To every house is built by some man. But he that built all things is God. So Christ is better than Moses. He's making this case. And after showing the superiority of angels, the, he's showing uh, Christ superior, better than Moses. Now, uh, you know, as I said, uh, you, many decades ago, there, there, there are these, there's a lot of rabbinic councils. And um, this is many decades ago, this, um, uh, 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 the... The, the conference of Jewish rabbis, they, they called Moses the greatest Jew that ever lived. That was in the, the early 20th century. Well, in the first century, this was the same mindset of these Jews. So that's why he had to make this case. He had to make the case. If they're going to, if they're going to get to the next level, they got to be able to realize that Jesus Christ was superior. Jesus Christ is superior to Moses, and he's, he's steady making this case. The builder of the house has more glory than the house, and Christ is the creator. Moses was just another creature. Jesus Christ created the house, the house that we call our faith. Moses was simply a servant in the house. Jesus is a son in the house. Look at verse 5. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast in confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You got to hang in there. You got to bleed that to the end. Jesus Christ owned the house. It rebuilt the house. Uh, Moses was simply a servant of the house. Does that make sense? The servant is not greater than the one who owns the house. The servant in the house is not greater than the son who owns the title to the house. 
Does that make sense? Hmm? Does, that, does that make Can you grasp that concept? The, uh, so, somebody working in the house, you know, you ever went somewhere and somebody looked like they own the place? You know, I mean, you, you, didn't work, you never worked there. But, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, years ago, I used to run this restaurant. It's a church of chicken restaurant. I worked there until working in quite a few of them. And uh, I ran the place like I owned the place. But I didn't own the place. I had to answer to somebody. So Moses was faithful in the house, but he didn't own the house. Jesus owned the house. Do you get that? So Jesus owned. He's, he was superior to Moses in that respect. So the uh, uh, Jesus came. Uh, the scripture says he was the apostle and high priest. Well, uh, uh, the apostle is one who is sent from God as God's ambassador. Jesus, when he Jesus came to earth as God's ambassador with the message from the Father. When he went back to the Father, he was the great high priest. Well, Moses served as God's ambassador, his spokesman, but it was Aaron who was the high priest, his brother. So, so Moses never had both offices. Aaron was the one who was, uh, uh, who was made high priest. Mo Moses was the spokesman for God, but, Mo but Aaron was the high priest. Jesus Christ was both. He was the apostle of our faith as well as the great high priest. So he, he, he wants to show you another area of superiority. So Christ is the son, Moses is the servant, and Jesus as the apostle and high priest. And Moses is called to be the apostle. But it was um, it was Aaron who was made high priest. And if you don't believe me, go to Exodus chapter four, verse fourteen. But it, it, nevertheless, Moses was a faithful servant in the house. Christ was a faithful son over the house, and that's where we get to when we get the, the, these first six verses. Now, when we get to verse 7, we're going to see the problem that prevents the rest, a, a real rest for God's people. That we, we, as we go through the book of Hebrews, it talks about a rest, and we'll explain that a little bit later. We'll, we'll get to it in just a second. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, for they have not known my ways. So I swear in, in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, uh, that quotation is actually from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Let's turn there right quick. It's, uh, 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 I'm just going to turn there. Uh, the Lord, you don't worry about it because it's not there. But I want you to see this. Psalm 95. Beginning at the seventh verse. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long have I grieved, was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, for they have not known my way. So this is word for word, this is verbatim. Straight from Psalm 95. So that's what the writer to the Hebrews here is quoting in these verses. Harden not your heart. 
This is the, the warning is against unbelief. See, it was unbelief that prevented them from entering into the rest. And, and, and as we, we look at the scripture, that there's there are five rests. That that they that the because of their unbelief, they did not experience. The first rest is the creation rest. God rested after six days of work. Uh, we see that one in, in Genesis. Enters into Canaan. Uh, when they entered into the promised land because of their unbelief, that generation, they were in the wilderness 40 years. God made sure they all died off. That first generation, the ones who were above the age of 20, none of them entered into the promised land. They didn't enter the rest. Canaan represented a rest from the wilderness. The, the wilderness represented a, a represented death because they all died that generation all died in the wilderness God let them all down of natural causes over, over that 40 year period and every single one of them other than Moses Aaron and Joshua were dead and even Moses never went into the promised land. God let him see it, but he wouldn't let him go. But they were not allowed to enter into the rest. So we got the creation rest. We got the entrance into Canaan. That was a rest from the wilderness journey. The, 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 the rest of salvation, you can read about that in Matthew 11, 28, which is a rest from the penalty of sin. Sin, is, sin messes us up. So when we get when we are saved, we are, we enter into a, a rest from the penalty of sin. Then uh, we also get a, a rest from consecration as we go through our um, uh, 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 the 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 maturation process of being a Christian. We basically we get a rest from the power of sin. But sin no longer has control over our bodies. You know, when you are in Christ, you allow the Holy Spirit, you, you stay under the Word, you stay under the teaching, you put into practice the principles, you practice uh, under the aid of the Holy Spirit to live righteously and holy before God and man, and, and eventually the stuff that you used to do because you couldn't help yourself, God gives you the power to, to, to overcome your own uh, evil, your own internal impulses. So he gives us a, a, a rest from the penalty of sin. We get that in salvation. But as we uh, allow consecration, we allow we allow the uh, the Holy Spirit to do it, to do the work of, uh, of of making us more and more Christ-like. We get a rest from the power of sin, and then the fifth rest in heaven. We actually get a rest from the presence of sin. When we get removed from the earth into heaven, we, are, we get a rest from the, the presence of sin. Verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of your Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's why we need that rest from sin. Sin deceives us. Sin has us thinking that we are more than, who, than what we are than who we are. Thinks us to, has us thinking that, that it's okay. Our sin natures will do that. But for we were made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. This is very important in that 
the hardening of the heart. The, 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 the hardening of the heart is a result of unbelief. When you uh, are faced with the truth that God has given us, and you choose not to believe it because of the hardness of the heart. Unbelief is the reason why they did not enter into the rest. And, he, and he's warning them, don't go there. Don't go down that road. You got to have, you see, the only way you are, faith, you are saved is by faith in Jesus Christ. And he's making the case that you can have faith in Christ. Now, they have not seen what Christ is going to do. Not yet. And the Hebrews, in the Old Testament, uh, um, it, they got types and shadows of the things. This was not the real deal. They simply got types and shadows. Uh, all of those Old Testament sacrifices, uh, it was not Final. It was just a, a shadow of the things to come. Uh, when they, when they, they would have the uh, all of those elements that were used in the, the, the worship at the temple were a, a, a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do on the cross. Uh, when they, they shed the blood of uh, the innocent lamb. When Jesus Christ was the lamb of God who shed his blood to, for, to take away our sin. Uh, but they did that offering with the lamb. It was done over and over and over again. And it had to be done over and over and over again because the people always sing it. But guess what? Jesus Christ sacrificed was only once and it covers all of our sin, past, present, and future. But until Jesus came and made the ultimate sacrifice, he, made the, he paid the, the ultimate sin debt in the meantime, all they had was the rituals in the temple. And it happened over and over and over again. Verse 17. But with whom was the grieved for but with whom was he grieved for the years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom Swear he that, sh that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief was the reason that caused the children of Israel to, to die in the wilderness. And unbelief is the reason why people in our generation are going to die in their sin. Unbelief. The only way you can be saved is to have faith in Jesus Christ. And, and if the, the Jews needed to understand that Jesus was, more, was superior to Moses, he was superior to the angels, he was superior to the prophets. Now we got the full story about Jesus. They didn't have it. But you still, the, the bottom line is this. The just shall live by faith. You still got to have faith in Jesus. See, this is a warning against unbelief. Lack of faith can rob a believer of the enjoyment of the satisfaction of their salvation. We can die in the wilderness just like they did. It's a, it, there are, there's a thing called the wilderness Christian right now. They, they, they because of unbelief. They, they, they may have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they have no power. They don't experience any victory. They may be going to heaven, but there's no joy. Because there are some areas that they have, they, 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 they may have believed Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin, but they don't believe that old things have passed away and behold, all things become new, and they're still addicted to whatever they were, they were addicted to. Because there are doubts in their mind that for well, God said you delivered and you don't believe it. God said God said you heal and you don't believe it. Uh, God said you the head and not the tail and you don't believe it. You got to believe what God said about you. God said you are more than a conqueror, but you live in, in doubt. You live in fear. 
you got to believe what God tells about you in order to experience all that God has for you. This is a fantastic book that we're going to learn. He, 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 if this writer was, was Paul, great. If it, if it wasn't, whoever it was was under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I wish Paul had just signed his name to it and said, I, Paul, wrote this, but he didn't. It looked like he did. Um, Peter quoted him, quoted this book, indicating that he thought it was Paul. When he said, when the, in 2 in, uh, in, um, Peter chapter 4, uh, he made the to of Paul, and he was speaking to the same group. So uh, uh, that letter was written to the same Hebrew Christians. So it makes me think it might have been Paul, but since Paul didn't sign his name to it. But nevertheless, we need to understand that unbelief is the biggest hindrance to our, it's the biggest hindrance to getting saved, but it's also the biggest hindrance to the progress that you're going to make as a Christian. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to stand before your children once again. We pray that they will not allow unbelief to rob them of their joy. I pray that they will not allow unbelief to rob them of their victory. And I pray that they will not allow Un unbelief to rob them of all the blessings that you have in store for them. I lift up the absent part of this body and I pray for those that are, are, that are struggling in, in many areas of life. I allow the blindness to come off and the scales to come off their eyes that they may see the glory that is to be revealed. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Now, this coming Sunday, we're going to uh, only be for one time, but we're going to start the worship service at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. rather than 10 uh, 15. So we're going to start a little early Sunday. Um, and we'll be back to our regular schedule after that. But uh, there, there's a reason for it. So we're going to start at, 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 uh, at 10 a.m. this coming Sunday. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy, the only true and wise God, the glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forever, and all of God's people say amen. Now, if uh, anybody want to give to the ministry, you may do so. Uh, dollar sign green WL is a cash app uh, symbol. Uh, any gift, any amount, would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we will see y'all next time.